Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very honored and grateful to be here speaking to you. Let me first apologize that I'm speaking to you in my language and not yours. Uh, I am a human rights lawyer, but I'm still an American human rights lawyer. Uh, and I want to thank the translators for making it possible for me to participate uh, in this event. Uh, I'm especially grateful to be here. Uh, the United States has not had a leftist party in about 100 years, so it feels nice to uh, be in a room full of people who are committed to, to social justice uh, and human rights. Uh, the topic that I have been asked to address by way of introduction is the, to describe the legal and political debates in the United States surrounding the issue of targeted killing. Uh, if that were all I was going to speak about, it would be a very short presentation. Uh, there has not been nearly enough legal and political debate in the United States uh, surrounding this very important issue. Uh, and, and that is a real disappointment to many of us. We're now approaching the 10th anniversary of the attacks of September 11th of 2001. Uh, and there have been a number of developments that made us initially quite optimistic that uh, the direction of the United States on human rights and counterterrorism would change, uh, beginning with the election in 2008 of a professor of constitutional law uh, replacing a war criminal uh, who had led the United States and the world into catastrophe for eight years. And it was, I believe, a German newspaper, not an American, that the day after Obama's election had the headline, President of the World. Uh, we've seen in recent months the Arab Spring. Uh, we've seen indigenous democratic movements throughout the Middle East that have made the cause of religious extremists much less relevant and pushed to the side. Uh, we have seen, and we will discuss this in more detail, the death of Osama bin Laden, uh, which in the United States uh, had tremendous symbolic importance, and one would have hoped would lead to some moment of closure. Uh, to a moment for the country to step back and reflect, rather than to double down, as a poker player would say, uh, on, on war uh, everywhere. Uh, and unfortunately, at least so far, uh, those events that I've described have not profoundly changed the direction of the United States on counterterrorism policies. Uh, and I hope that that's something that we can discuss. Uh, I almost certainly will not speak for 20 to 30 minutes, uh, for selfish reasons, I'm much more interested in interacting with you, hearing what your questions are, and having a discussion, uh, rather than lecturing to you uh, about what's going on um, in the United States. Uh, President Obama's election was a watershed in some ways. On his second day in office, he signed a series of presidential executive orders that prohibited torture in all circumstances that ordered the CIA to close its network of secret prisons where renditions took place, that ordered, although maybe that's the wrong word, the closure of Guantanamo prison within one year. Uh, it wasn't much of an order because that, of course, hasn't happened. Uh, and, and these were symbolic, but not just symbolic. They did place the power and the prestige of the presidency behind the restoration of the rule of law. Uh, but I think looking back on that day, uh, it now appears to be what we would call a high water mark for President Obama on human rights. Uh, and that what we have seen more since then is that policies and practices that were considered extreme and unlawful under the Bush administration have been brought at least rhetorically within the rule of law by the Obama administration. And there's a danger that what we're seeing is the establishment of what we're calling a new normal, uh, where there is a separate law of counterterrorism, and where the traditional protections of human rights law, uh, trials and evidence and legal process, can be cast aside when the president, when the executive, uh, claims national security, claims a threat of terrorism. Uh, and we're seeing really a displacement uh, of traditional human rights and domestic law uh, by a kind of military law that is not regulated uh, by the courts. Uh, we've seen this in Guantanamo, of course, now for almost 10 years, uh, and now we're seeing it with this issue of, uh, a very difficult issue of targeted killing. And I want to say at the outset, this is a difficult issue. Uh, 
this is not a black and white issue. This is not rendition or torture. Uh, every time a human being is tortured, a crime has been committed. Every single time. There is simply no legal or moral justification to torture anyone. Uh, and you hear the argument sometimes that if it's illegal to torture someone, it must also be illegal to do worse, which is to kill that person. But that is actually not the state of the law. Uh, and we all know that, whether we know it through law or we know it through intuition. Uh, of course, some killings are illegal, uh, even if we don't like it. Uh, there is a law of war. Uh, soldiers, belligerents in armed combat, have a privilege to kill each other. They're not prosecuted for killing each other. Uh, and there are rules that govern death in war. Uh, people in law enforcement can kill in self-defense or in defense of life, uh, even outside the context of an armed conflict. Uh, if a law enforcement officer sees someone killing another person in public, uh, he can take the life of the killer. That's not considered a murder. Uh, so when we talk about targeted killings, we're entering a terrain unlike torture, uh, unlike arbitrary detention, unlike some of the other issues that we've dealt with in the last 10 years, um, where we have to look behind the initial fact to the facts beneath it. We have to ask a series of questions beyond the first question in order to de determine whether this killing was a lawful one uh, or whether it was a lawful one. Uh, and in fact, even this term, targeted killing, uh, which I heard you using even when you spoke in German, is a controversial term. Uh, and there's a question whether it's a neutral term, uh, as I tend to use it, where its legality is not suggested or illegality. Uh, there are some people who prefer to use the term extrajudicial killing or even assassination uh, but I think that those terms carry conclusions, legal conclusions, in a way that the term targeted killing does not. Uh, and, and there are a range of views about the legality of the practice that we're talking about. And, and, and here I think that the context that most of us uh, call to mind when we talk about targeted killing uh, is the use of aerial drones, uh, uh, remote piloted planes that fire missiles uh, in Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, and also in other places, in Yemen and Somalia. Um, but targeted killings can also be other kinds of killings. The killing of bin Laden, for example, was a special forces raid uh, by soldiers who shot him with a, with a pistol in the head. Uh, and so when I use the term, I'm referring really uh, to any kind of operation where uh, someone is deliberately killed uh, rather than captured. Uh, and, and you see a range of views. Um, there are some uh, in the human rights community who say that any operation that targets an individual for death uh, is murder, plain and simple. That it's a violation of the sovereignty of the state in which it takes place, uh, and that it is a murder and that there is no possible justification uh, for an operation that sets out to kill uh, rather than setting out to, to capture. Uh, you know, of course, the Obama administration and the Bush administration took a very, very different view. Um, they had a very broad definition of armed conflict. Um, they assert that the United States is engaged in an armed conflict, a legal armed conflict, uh, not against a state, but against an organization, Al-Qaeda, uh, against the Taliban, and against what they call associated forces, other terrorist groups that are affiliated. Uh, they don't recognize borders uh, in this armed conflict. Uh, and they say that these are lawful killings, uh, as in any other war. Uh, and they've also asserted that the killings are justifiable as self-defense uh, on a national scale. That the people who are being targeted for death are people who have first targeted the United States for terrorist attacks, and therefore uh, those killings uh, are lawful. Now, they haven't said this in any great detail. Uh, you know, these are the, the positions that they've taken uh, in general. Um, but they have not been really transparent uh, about the rules that they apply for determining when uh, targeted killings are lawful and, and when they are not. Uh, with respect, for example, to the killing of bin Laden, uh, the United States has asserted both of those justifications that I just mentioned. First, that he is an operational commander of an enemy in a war, in an armed conflict, and therefore he can be killed under the laws of war. Uh, and second, that even outside of war, that it was an act of national self-defense to kill this person 
who killed our people first. Um, I think that when President Obama said that Bin Laden had been brought to justice, many of us in the human rights movement raised our eyebrows. It's not necessarily our idea of, of justice in this circumstance, and many of us would have preferred to see a trial. Uh, but both of those justifications um, were offered. Um, now again, this, the legal question is particularly difficult um, in the part of Pakistan that borders Afghanistan. Um, because there's nothing inherently illegal, again, under the laws of war, and here I'm not speaking of my opinion, I'm speaking of uh, you know, established international law. There's nothing inherently unlawful about using a drone in a war as opposed to any other weapon. Uh, and so, t uh, most of the drone attacks in Afghanistan uh, are considered by international legal experts, including the Red Cross, uh, to be in the context of an armed conflict between the United States and Afghanistan and the Taliban. Uh, in Pakistan, the question is much more complicated uh, because the law doesn't allow combatants in an armed conflict to gain sanctuary simply by crossing a border. Uh, the law doesn't say that a member of Al-Qaeda or the Taliban who is lawfully targetable in Afghanistan uh, becomes off-limits the second that he crosses a border. Uh, and so we really don't know enough to evaluate the legality uh, of many of the attacks uh, that have been taking place in Pakistan. And we don't know the position of the Pakistani government because what they say in public uh, is quite certainly uh, very different uh, than what they say in private. Um, now, the further away you get from a battlefield like Afghanistan, the more questionable this policy becomes. And I would say, uh, the less legal, and the more clearly illegal. And uh, my organization, the American Civil Liberties Union, has tried to bring one of these cases to the American courts. Um, and this was a case that began when the United States government essentially announced in newspapers, in, leaked to the press, um, that a U.S. citizen named Anwar al-Awlaki, uh, a Yemeni cleric hiding in Yemen, had been targeted for death by the CIA and the US military. And he had been put on a list of people who the US was trying to kill. Uh, now Yemen is uh, more than a thousand kilometers, many more, uh, away from any of what we would consider the battlefields in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and so uh, our belief was that someone in Yemen is not involved in an armed conflict against the United States, that the killing could only be justified the person who's in the act of carrying out an attack. Uh, and we wanted to have a US court establish legal boundaries uh, for when these killings were legal and when they were not. Um, not because we had any idea of whether Anwar al Awlaki was a threat or not, this is someone who I've never met, uh, but because this was really the only opportunity that we have been given to try to bring these issues to a court in the United States. We have very technical doctrines in the U.S. about how to get into court. Uh, the organization couldn't go by itself. We needed to represent a client who was in danger uh, of uh, facing a targeted killing. Uh, and unfortunately, the U.S. courts uh, did not consider the very important uh, legal issues that are raised by this. Uh, they simply said that whether and when to use legal force uh, is a question for the executive, for the president, or for Congress, the elected officials. It's not a question for the courts uh, to be involved in, that it's not a justiciable question. Uh, and I should point out here that this is a different answer than the Israeli Supreme Court gave when confronted with the same question. Uh, that court said that it was emphatically a question for courts to be involved in, uh, that some targeted killings were legal and others were illegal, uh, but that this was an issue that judges should supervise. Uh, and I think there's been a lot of criticism, correct criticism, um, that the Israeli army has not followed the decision of the Israeli Supreme Court. Uh, but if it had, uh, that actually was not a, not a bad decision for human rights and, and a much better outcome than we were able to achieve um, in the United States. Uh, you know, there's a question for us as human rights advocates, uh, as people who are concerned about the right to life, concerned about this idea that the uh, struggle against terrorism, the counterterrorism, should be defined as uh, 
uh, you know, a war that takes place everywhere, that lasts forever. Uh, the way that the United States has essentially defined its struggle against terrorism, um, it's able to use military force rather than the rule of law uh, anywhere that a terrorism suspect may be located. Uh, and, and this is done in the name of making Americans and making the world safer. I think there's a very, very strong argument that it's having exactly the opposite effect. Uh, exactly the opposite effect. Um, that firing missiles uh, into people's country is uh, just as likely, if not more likely, to create terrorists uh, than to kill them. That undermining a worldwide legal regime based on reciprocity will make the world more dangerous. That setting a precedent that uh, we can kill our enemies wherever they may be located is one that will be emulated and copied. Um, that we will not, and already do not, have a monopoly on the technology of war and death that's being used here. Uh, and that the people who have the most to lose here are ourselves. Uh, that uh, by essentially allowing and encouraging any country to treat the threat of terrorism as one of war rather than one of crime and one to be dealt with uh, as a question of law, uh, we are really undermining the stability uh, of an international legal regime that really depends on everybody uh, playing by the same kind of rules and respecting those rules. Um, ten years after September 11th, it's time for us to contextualize the threat of terrorism, to not see it as an existential threat to our way of life, to not continue to be governed by a law of emergency uh, that gives more power to the government, uh, but to understand that uh, although it's a menace, uh, it's one that will not destroy our way of life uh, and one that we need to live with. Uh, what it may threaten to destroy uh, is our legal institutions. Um, and, and, and if that happens, um, you know, it can be said that uh, we will have lost. So I, I will, I'll stop my remarks here. I think there are going to be a lot of questions about this, but, uh, but let me stop here.